Hi, welcome back to Membrane Function in Biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so the specific topic we're going to look at here is a potassium channel, or just in general an ion channel. And it's not enough just to say that, if you look at this picture, you can pretty well see it. This right here is a potassium ion. In fact, these are all potassium ions, and you see that potassium is present a lot on the inside of the cell, and it goes in here through the channel and out to the outside of the cell. Okay, you probably learned that in physiology or cell biology, but what is the molecular basis for that? And normally the topic that's discussed here is if potassium goes through, potassium, that's K plus, why is it only potassium? Now one thing you have to think about, and I'm just gonna go over here for one second, is you have to think about um, some of these alkali metals, okay? These are, these are metals that when they're ionized have plus charges. You're familiar with potassium and sodium, which is shown on the bottom in blue. Now, we have an intuitive sense that, okay, a good example of this is if you're trying to walk through a doorway, right? You're trying to walk through a doorway, you can easily fit through a doorway, right? If you try to put anything smaller, okay, you try to throw a baseball through a doorway, it goes through. You try to throw a dust particle through it, it'll obviously go through. So potassium, as we can see here, obviously it's a potassium channel, is it's small enough to get through the channel. Well, sodium's smaller than potassium. Why doesn't it go through? I mean, surely space-wise it would fit. And then you could also make the argument lithium. Lithium is an alkali metal cation. It's smaller than sodium. Why don't other things go through it? What allows for the selectivity for potassium ions and really nothing else? And I'm going to answer this question um, uh, right now, but I'm just we're going to go through this list right here, and then we're going to discuss them in detail. So I just want to give you an idea of what this is. Number one, the first reason is that the energy of dehydration for sodium is too high. Okay, that's a complicated statement. I want you to look at this potassium ion right here, and you can even see it as it goes into the channel. The potassium ion is the green uh, ball in the center. The molecules that are surrounding it are water molecules, okay? So when you have these ions, positively charged ions like potassium in solution, and even sodium, they are what we call solvated. They have a hydration sphere around them, which just means that there's water molecules surrounding that ion from all sides. It's a stabilizing effect for the cation. It turns out that it is, in this case, it is much easier to take the water molecules off of potassium than it is sodium. Turns out it's much easier. There's actually two reasons for that, and I'll go ahead and just talk about one of them. Um, number one, potassium is larger. And it turns out that to remove uh, things like water from a larger atom or ion is a lot easier because those water molecules are further away from the nucleus of the potassium. Okay, turns out for smaller ions like sodium, it's a lot more difficult because the water molecules approach the nucleus a lot more closely. So that's one reason, and then there's another reason it's a lot harder to remove the water molecules from sodium, or in other words, to dehydrate it, okay? And we'll talk about that. And we're gonna talk about the second one in more detail in a minute. The bond distance between potassium and the backbone carbonyls, which are in the channel, is the same distance as between potassium and the hydrating waters, okay? So what you sort of have to imagine, and I'm going to do this very quickly, if you were to have this potassium ion right there. Okay, technically for the water molecules, there is a certain distance between really the oxygen and the potassium, okay? There's a certain distance that we're gonna talk about, and this distance right here that I'm indicating right there, that distance, is the same distance as we're gonna find for the potassium and the backbone carbonyls, which are actually located inside the channel. And that's actually gonna be a, a very stabilizing effect, okay? And there's another thing, the difference in the hydration sphere coordination number between sodium and potassium is also thought to play a role. What that means is that 
Technically, because potassium is larger and it has some d orbitals, potassium has more waters, or at least a different number of waters surrounding it than sodium, and it has a different geometry, therefore. And the geometry of those waters around the potassium is thought to be just right to fit through this channel. So the waters surrounding the sodium really are, are thought to be the improper geometry to be able to move through this channel. All right, let's look at the channel. All right, so two things to, to notice, okay? This whole sequence in here that you see of like this uh, ball and stick models closest to these potassiums, the red, these things right here in red, those, those are the backbone carbonyls, okay? And I have a depiction over here, and we'll look at this in a minute and explain it. But these right here are the backbone carbonyls. They are going to interact electrostatically with the potassium ions, okay? Then you have these uh, alpha helical, uh, uh, alpha helices right here. And if you remember when we talked about alpha helices before, or if you haven't seen the video on those, they technically have a net dipole where one side is positively charged and the other side actually has a net negative charge, okay, or it's more negative. It turns out that because potassium is positively charged, the protein orients the negative charge on this side where the potassium is going to enter the channel. And since potassium has a plus charge that's going to interact favorably with the helices right here, and that's going to facilitate potassium moving closer to um, basically the channel part where these uh, uh, backbone carbonyls are. Okay, so the alpha, helixi, the alpha helices, these uh, dipole negative charges, are going to attract the potassium and bring it ultimately up here. Okay. Now, we said that potassium normally is hydrated, meaning it has water molecules surrounding it in solution. Well, something's going to happen when this, uh, this hydrated potassium comes up here. The water molecules are going to be displaced, and they're going to be replaced with these carbonyl oxygens. So let's talk about what the carbonyl oxygens do. Okay, and I've grossly ab abbreviated them here, but essentially they're the CO double bond, particularly the oxygens of the carbonyl. Well, remember one thing, potassium is a lot, not a lot larger, but it is significantly larger with respect to sodium. So these carbonyls are sort of in a, in a sort of a fixed location, although they move a little bit, but they're pretty much fixed. So there's a certain distance between these carbonyl oxygens and the potassium. And remember what I said, that distance between the carbonyl oxygens and the potassium, it turns out is the same distance as between the waters that, that are bonded essentially to the potassium ions in solution. They're the same distance. So it turns out that because the distances are about the same, it doesn't really take a whole lot of energy to remove those water molecules. Okay, Not to mention the fact that potassium is larger, so intrinsically it's going to be easier anyways to remove them. But the whole point is, is that because this distance right here between the carbonyl oxygen and the potassium is the same as the water potassium distance, there's really no net change in energy for taking off the water molecules and now having the carbonyl oxygens um, bound to the potassium electrostatically. And that's what you see here. When this hydrated potassium moves up, essentially the water molecules are going to come off and now the potassium ions, and this, these are all potassium, they're, even though they're different colors, they're just showing which sites are occupied at different uh, points in time. But you see the potassium ions are now chelated, or they're held in there, by these carbonyl oxygens, and that's going to facilitate its movement up here through to the other side of the channel. And once the potassium exits the channel, it gets rehydrated by waters on the other side, as we would expect. Okay. Now, why do, again, the main question they're going to ask on the test, or the main concept you want to learn, is why doesn't sodium go through? Well, if you look at the distances here between the carbonyl oxygens and the potassium, okay, you see about the distance. If you notice for sodium, that, oops, let me get this, that distance is a lot larger, okay? It's a lot larger than it is for potassium. Turns out that this distance right here is very different than the distance between the water molecules and sodium. Okay, and so it turns out that it, it would take significantly more energy to remove the water molecules and have the carbonyl oxygens then bind the sodium. And it's such high energy to do that, that it just doesn't happen. In other words, 
what we said here, the energy of dehydration for sodium is too high. Now, you can make the argument that sodium is smaller, and so as a result, it's going to be more difficult anyways to take the water molecules off. But the main reason for this protein is because this carbonyl sodium distance is far too large, and it makes it very thermodynamically unfavorable to remove the water, so it just doesn't. And one thing that you can see here is that any ion that's going to pass through here has to have its water molecules removed. The water doesn't pass through, it's only the ion. So if you can't remove the waters, that ion's never going to move through, but you can remove the waters from potassium and it can move through. Okay, and this is the second point that, that I've already mentioned. The bond distance between potassium and backbone carbonyls is approximately the same distance as between the potassium and the hydrating waters, making it thermodynamically indifferent, really, to remove the waters and replace them with carbonyl oxygens. It's no, re no real change in energy because the distance is about the same. It doesn't really take any um, doing to do that. Also, there's a difference in the hydration sphere coordination number between sodium and potassium. What that basically means is that because potassium is larger and has some extra d orbitals, it ultimately can have more water molecules than sodium around it, which gives it a different geometry. And it turns out that it's thought that the geometry of the water surrounding the potassium also plays a role with the entry of potassium into the channel. Sodium probably has the wrong geometry, and so it's not able to get into the channel for that reason. But the main reason, and I want to emphasize this point, is really thought to be these two points right here. These are the two really important points. That it takes way more energy to remove the waters from sodium, and that's because of this fact right here, is that the bond distance between the carbonyls and the sodium is far larger than it is for the water. So it takes more, way more energy input to remove those waters and put this, the carbonyls there instead. Potassium, this bond distance is about the same as it would be for the water, so it really doesn't take any energy to do that. It just happens. And then so ultimately what we're looking at, potassium is hydrated. It moves into this little um, water channel right here. So the potassium gets dehydrated. It moves through the channel, moving through these carbonyl oxygens, which are stabilizing it. Also, this helix dipole negative charge helps to orient the potassium up to the carbonyl oxygens. And then once it passes through, it ultimately gets rehydrated on the other side. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. This is how the potassium channel works. Other channels may work a little bit differently, but it's all going to have to do with energy of moving through. What's most favorable? And there's different mechanisms by which that occurs. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.